Thank you, Henry. And thank you, Nadia. Thanks for, um, thanks for bringing me on. Yeah. That'd be good if we start just by talking a little bit about this theory that you had about city as liturgy and your reading of Jane Jacobs's work, just for the benefit of everyone who hasn't read her work. And also just as a refresher of like what liturgy is and like how that relates to cities in your mind. Yeah. So, so to start, you know, with Jane Jacobs, she, she did not finish college. She did do a couple of years at Columbia in the 1930s. And when she got to a point where they insisted that she choose a major, she quit. Um, she wanted to, to be free to organize her education any way she saw fit. And um, I mean, to follow the intellectual leads as they, as they came to her. And, but she was a journalist in New York City and she covered um, the effects of the Urban Renewal Act. I think there's, there's a more official name for it, of 1949, which really devastated American cities and um, replaced kind of the, the living order replaced what was the living order of the old city with this very abstract, very visual, kind of formal, pretty order that was underneath all that was lifeless and dead. In 1961, she published her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. It was an instant hit. Um, I don't know how much impact it had on the field of urban planning initially, or even still today. I certainly wish there, there was more evidence of what she wrote there is being followed. But I, I came to her book many years later, just as a side thing while I was working on my dissertation in theology. And one day I just happened to notice that it was, she was describing cities as if they were liturgies. So there's a, there's a book that helped me to, uh, to, to um, understand Jane Jacobs. I mean, of course, I, I, the moment I read The Death and Life of Great American Cities, I was in love with that book. I was in love with just her, her writing style, her insight, um, her rebellious nature against, you know, what was the, the accepted reasoning of the day. And also it's really a, a, a text about racial injustice because of the over 2000 American uh, city neighborhoods that were completely, you know, dynamited down to the rubble to make way for urban renewal. Um, 1700 of them were largely African-American neighborhoods. So a huge blow to the African-American urban communities. And no one talks about that still today. She's, there's like one other book you hear about. So, so on many levels, I, I loved Death and Life. Um, but there's another uh, a theologian in England named Catherine Pickstock. And she wrote a book called After Writing. And the subtitle is On the Liturgical Consummation of Philosophy. And I didn't read that book super closely because it's kind of technical and dense, but I, her basic point was that um, she thought that Descartes had aspired for, aspired to, to bring us to a mode of knowing that was impersonal and visual and outside of time. And, and, I, and it was during actually my, my uh, comprehensive exams for the dissertation at Catholic U in Washington that it just hit me that, um, what Pickstock was accusing Descartes of doing is what Jane Jacobs had accused the urban planners of her day of doing. They, they substituted a living, uh, very sophisticated, rich and subtle order um, with something that was visually flashy and comprehensible, but that was outside of time and therefore dead. So, so, that, so when I first had that insight, I just said, you know what, maybe I'll write my dissertation about the role of time as an actual raw material in city building in death and life. And it was a few months later when I just, the title of it, the title of the book itself finally hit me with its full force. And I realized actually in many levels, you know, a cities for her are liturgies. Just to like round out the, uh, the city aspect of it before we move to the, the liturgy part. Um, I had a, a similar, just sort of bold over reaction when I read uh, Death and Life in that, um, I, as you, I mean, it's just really worth reemphasizing that her, her style of writing is just incredible. Um, she's very openly rebellious and openly like pissed off with the way that urban planning is um, being treated today. And she bases all of this research on uh, not stepping outside of, you know, academia or, um, uh, industry and the way things are being done and bases it off of like, she's just looking at cities and observing what's happening. 
and sort of using this um, common sense logic that she's uh, very explicitly trying to democratize um, our understanding of urban planning by saying, look, anyone can look around in a city. If you talk to the citizens, you talk to people living in cities, um, they're not going to agree with the way that we talk about urban planning on a grand scale. Um, and if I could sort of like, I guess, maybe summarize a little bit of uh, what the establishment was like back, I guess, before she published this, um, it seemed like it, it was sort of your classic, like, let's plan a city from scratch um, or th the sort of thing that led to like, you know, uh, the creation of like suburbs as a place for um, well-to-do people to move to, to move out of the city. And it was kind of leading to these issues that we saw around um, just like, I guess, like inner city kind of kind of problems where um, everyone else was being left behind. And there was just sort of this grand vision of if only we could like design all the houses in exactly the right locations, then uh, then everything would just look perfect. Um, just to sort of oversimplify a little bit. Um, and she, I think, and, and to her, that was like the city being this sort of like dead artifact kind of thing where, you know, you just put a bunch of houses down and everything stays exactly the same for the next hundred years or whatever. And in her view, uh, city, treating cities more as these living organisms that kind of grow and shape and are, are really shaped by um, the people and, and their environment, um, there isn't really an objective reality of like what a city is. And it certainly does change over time. Um, yeah, produce like a completely different set of um, observations and recommendations around urban planning. Um, so that's kind of what I got got out of it. Um, and then I think when when I read it, I was kind of taking it in the direction of her description of cities being a lot like um, like the internet as a city, I guess, um, and that we have this sort of like digital lives that are also very like organic and complex and um, separate from or yeah, similar to, to the way that cities are. Um, and so, yeah, like I totally on, on the same page about, uh, about her impact on cities, uh, the idea of like city as liturgy, I, I wanted to sort of like unpack a little bit more. Um, we had an episode on liturgy and I'm, I'm kind of the, I guess, like theological noob here. Um, and I remember we talked about liturgy as sort of like, uh, religious rituals or habits or things that you do that sort of like reinforce, um, I guess your practice. Uh, and so, yeah, I wanted to just sort of unpack a little bit more from your side. Like, what is that? Is that right? <laughs> um, what What is liturgy? Um, and then, yeah, how how did you see the the parallels being drawn to the way Jane Jacobs describes cities? Yeah, that, these are these are all you know. These are great questions. You know, let's see, what is liturgy? I mean, as a as a mode of knowing, liturgy revolves around the idea that you know, or organic order is not meant to be known all at once. Or like, think of it as a, as a person, you're not meant to know a person all at once. We don't introduce ourselves with, you know, a biography or the full life story, but rather living systems are meant to be known recursively. And that's a little off the topic, but I guess recursion is a way to think about, or al algorithmic is a way to think about liturgy. It's a, it's a system that's running some basic equation, you know, one time, and then using the results from that first time, running the same equation again and again. It's, it's doing that, um, you know, potentially infinitely, and it's as it's as it's doing so, it's generating a fractal order, and so. The city for Jacobs is an al is like something. It's running an algorithm. It's it's solving certain problems that are perennial problems of city life, and it's resolving them in patterned ways that are also perennial. And in that sense, it's there's an algorithm running there, and that's that's kind of what liturgy does as well. I mean, think about like rituals around death. Well, that is a perennial problem. Someone you love dies. I mean this. This has happened, you know, since humans existed. And how do you cope with that? How do you, how do you, um, how do you incorporate that back into life and overcome the shock, overcome that challenge? And we turn to religious rituals to do so, memorial services or funerals or what have you, different ways of memorizing a person or, or you know, um, teaching about the person to the next generation. So... The details are infinitely varied, but the patterns and the, and the challenges are the same. 
And, uh, and that's a basic sense in which cities are like liturgies. Of course, the other one is just the word liturgy in Greek just means the work of the people. And that's, that's the whole darn point of death and life is that these planners thought the city was the work of, you know, 50 smart men. And she was saying, no, the city is created by the plans and dreams and efforts of many people. And in fact, the reason we have slums is because the inhabitants of those places are denied access to credit, uh, financial credit, with which they could start businesses, repair their homes, improve their homes. Basically, the, the, if credit isn't available widely, then the liturgy ceases, the liturgy of the, of the, of the city. The algorithm stops. Um, was that, did I get kind of go too far astray there? Yeah, no, that's beautiful. It actually relates really well, I think, the software. <laughs> um, yeah, like mentioning recursion. Um, and I, 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 for me, I like listening to that. I, I hear such a clear crossover to the way we talk about the web today. Um, there's, I guess, you, you had done for this Cartesian read of cities or of, and I, I think of, I guess, the Cartesian read of digital spaces too, where uh, we think of the tools that we have now being sort of static or being sort of fixed um, and, and losing the aspect of like digital spaces being built by, by the work of the people, which I think is just a really nice, um, succinct way of, of describing liturgy. Um, I'm wondering what the just to get super clear on it, like what it, what is the Cartesian read of liturgy then? Or is, is there one here? Oh, I mean, the, the Car Cartesian read of liturgy is, you know, ditch it. And, you know, salvation, you know, is not a, it's not a, there isn't that recursive element of getting to know Christ, let's say for a Christian. It is just, you're saved or you're not. And, and at the same time, um, services are just lectures. Right. So, so that's, it's just, it's just mind to mind. It, it isn't anymore that sense of that the entire person, body, soul, un unconscious, psyche, uh, emotions, everything. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, what's the point of worshiping if there's no incense? I mean, speaking of, you know, to, to Christians or Jews, because, you know, they, we have a biblical vision that in heavenly worship, there's incense. Like if you're not going to impact the most basic uh, and ancient set one of the five senses, then you know what? Are, what why are you bothering? You know it, you, what are you really doing in the end? So, um, so I think in, in Descartes, you, know, you just you know religion is a is a is a doctrine. You know it. You assent to it intellectually. Game over. Get on with your life. Now that doesn't mean because this goes back to the final chapter of death and life, and that's really the crucial chapter. That there are three kinds of science that we know how to do. And in two of them, that kind of Cartesian approach really works. And Jacob's, Jacob's was not an anti-Cartesian at that level. In fact, what I try to say is that she saves the Enlightenment because she, she gives us a postmodern science that respects the role of modern science, the first two kinds of scientific problem solving. So I think there is a sense you know, speaking of now back to the theological side in which you're either saved or you're not, right? There is that digital sense that, you know, binary, yes, no, but, but you cannot lose sight of the two other kinds of, of, um, of, of scientific problem solving that we have. What are the, as I'm just sort of thinking about this, uh, like, what are the policy implications for taking the more like organized complexity approach, um, that she advocates. So like if, if we want to really emphasize that rituals or cities or our, our spaces around us are built by people, what does that imply about like in religion? What does that imply? Does it mean that we can't have a centralized figure to rally around or does it mean, or does it just mean that the people should be reflected better in, in the rituals that we, we take on? Well, I, I think, I, can I, can I put in a plug for an article by a friend? Yes. Um, it, it's, it's called, uh, an exploration of hierarchy as fractal in the theology of Dionysius, the Areopagite. Um, and it's by a friend of mine named Georgia J. Williams, Georgia Williams. And, um, this word hierarchy was first co coined, I mean, as a noun, as a, as a proper noun like that in the, in the, maybe the 500s AD, 
And what it meant in the theology of this, this um, saint of the early church, Dionysius, was basically what we mean as by fractal. So you kind of have to just re, you, you, you cannot, you can't dispense with hierarchy, but you have to understand it fractally. And I think, Henry, you were saying that that relates to this whole notion of subsidiarity, which I haven't really, I haven't really read about. But just to give you an example that I used to discuss with Jane Jacobs in person when I was visiting her and talking to her on the phone, the answer to, to the currency issue is that we need currencies at many fractal scales. And those, those currencies should be um, related. I mean, as you, go, as you go down the scale, there should be more of them covering less area. Like there ought to be in the United States county currencies and state currencies, and you know, 50 of those, and then one national currency. And so this issue of how you get people involved, first of all, you have to empower them to get involved, you know, to control their own lives, like right where they are. But, but then, of course, they will be in these nested, you know, networks. Yeah, I guess speaking of subsidiarity, uh, it's a term from the Catholic Church. Um, it says it's a it's an organizing principle that matters should be handled by the smallest or lowest, uh, least centralized authority. And so all decisions should be taken at the local level, if possible, and like kind of like moving up. So it kind of reminds me of like doing things only when necessary or like even like a lazy way of thinking or it's not like everything has to be handled by the people that have the most context around what they're handling. And it even kind of reminds me of a post that Nadia did about like foundations and whether open source projects should join a foundation for their own governance and when to like add more people and add governance. And it's kind of like do it when it requires it to be happen rather than beforehand. It's very strange because I get a lot of pushback on, I had this sort of emerging view about governance related to that post I wrote about foundations that um, like you should be attempting, I guess, minimum, like the, the minimum viable governance of like, don't over engineer governance, um, do the minimum amount that's necessary to prevent, I guess, like further conflict. Um, and in some cases, you might not actually need to formalize governance at all if everyone is if it's a small enough group and everyone's getting along great. Um, and I get pushback on it because people think that's how I guess if we don't talk about it, that it can lead to the tyranny of structurelessness of we're not defining governance at all and therefore everyone's kind of running wild and terrible things are happening. Um, and I think uh, I mean neither 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 end of the spectrum is great, but the idea that if we over-engineer governance, I think it leads to that sort of like Cartesian look that uh, that we're talking about of like, you just have these sort of like objective uh, or yeah, these sort of objective principles that came from somewhere else besides being derived from the people and um, they're not actually meaningful to anyone. Um, and yeah, I guess that, that's the part that I want to kind of try to avoid. Plus, in the American context, it's tricky because if you if you sort of speak for this idea of you know, subsidiarity or localism, or whatever, then that kind of gets hijacked by, say, more, the more conservative voice to um, to just promote a kind of um, you know just a, a laissez-faire attitude about a lot of things, which um, I think, which in practice means that you know, merchants or corporations that have some first mover advantage will, they will dictate structures. And um, it's, I think it's, it takes work to preserve um, a genuine local, and, and in any case, maybe, maybe our political discussion in the United States is hopelessly broken because our economics is broken. And, and unless we really understood why local currencies, you know, in the Jane Jacobs vision are so crucial, well, then we're really trying to govern ourselves in, in, a, in a vacuum independently of our economic lives. And that just can't work. Right. It says, and this has a lot of crossover. Henry and I are talking about this um, with Eleanor Ostrom's work. I don't know if you've also uh, read her stuff. Um, but she, I've only heard of it from you guys, so that's forgive me yeah, for that. Big fan. Yeah. If you love Jane Jacobs, you should also read Eleanor Astrum. Um, okay. But she 
I think had a similar methodological approach of trying to ignore she was she was basically trying to resolve the issue of um tragedy of the commons and prisoner's dilemma and talking about these um, sort of game theory uh approaches that say that essentially assume that people are going to act in their own self-interest until they destroy the communities around them and she went and looked at fisheries and um aquifer or water management and, and, and things like that and and looked at these smaller communities to say and using that to um to make an argument for governance that is highly localized where uh, where you retain sort of boundaries of membership and um and bring context and meaning to the people that are being quote unquote governed and saying that um i guess her thesis being that you don't necessarily need to rely on the market or the state or these sort of outside actors to intervene to prevent people from destroying each other um with the right conditions people will self-organize and not destroy themselves um and so yeah there's a lot of i think crossover there around the idea of keeping governance as as localized as possible right right there's some there's some confusion in the american context it's like the, the thought that the government shouldn't intervene then becomes almost becomes then like a spiritual attitude that i shouldn't care about the commons and and work in other ways to you know like you like you just said there i mean in, in, a, in a bottom up organic way to resolve these issues you know things just get resolved very simply at some national level of like oh should the government or shouldn't it but that's really not the point the point is you know we have to live in this society in this world and we're gonna you know have to fix what needs to be fixed one way or another yes it is like yeah if one end the fear is tyranny of structurelessness where we don't define anything and then strange things come out of it um and then the other end being i guess maybe like cartesian government or i don't exactly know the right term for that but uh where everything is so objectively handed down from above and it's so hierarchical that it it means nothing to people do you want to talk a little i realize we didn't actually kind of break down a little bit um the the differences between she talks about like simplicity disorganized complexity and then her focus being around this idea of organized complexity and um and I know we touched on it kind of broadly, but uh, do you want to like go in a little bit on what those differences are and how she manages to tie science, these sort of like more scientific methodological approaches to her style of of doing things? Yeah. So so Jacob starts, you know, with the idea that you know that for her modern science begins, you know, roughly around sixteen hundred, and the idea that we're going to have, you know, generate falsifiable hypotheses and the experimental method and, and really be dedicated to reality and reason. And she says just, you know, the fact of it is that in the first three centuries of science from 1600 to 1900, in her opinion, well, I'll say where she gets that opinion from in a second, we could only do one of the three kinds of science. And that was what she calls problem, problems in simplicity which are two variable problems where the dependence of one factor depends, you know, wholly on the dependence of some other single factor. And actually she's, it's just serendipity that when she was writing her death and life um, through the, this grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, there was a guy there named Warren Weaver who was retiring after 27, 28 years as head of kind of deciding who got the, the research money from Rockefeller uh, and Warren Weaver um, wrote, he, he's the one who wrote this report on what are these three kinds of science. And that's what she used. And, and she could show pretty clearly that her opponents were using the second kind of science, a statistical approach, and then looking for ways to reduce it to the first kind of science, the simplicity approach. And she was, and she just said, it turns out, you know, cities are something else. They're, they're like biological life forms and they're, they're, they're living organisms. And those two kinds of science are just not appropriate when you're studying something living. You have to use this third kind of science that's only been discovered in the last 30 years called the problem in organized complexity. And I try to argue to my students that that this chapter 22 of Death and Life, and really the Warren Weaver report itself, um, that those are, th that report should be governing the university. That every child should be learning those three, that those three kinds of science exist from the time they're in, in elementary school, but certainly in college. 
And, and we should be very explicit about when we're doing which kind of science, the reductive, the statistical, or the, the biological. And, um, and so, she, so she's saying, what I've tried to do in this book is reinvent urban planning as if it were you know, a species of biology, essentially. And then she spends the rest of her life trying to do the same thing for economics, for which, by the way, she's been completely ignored. I mean, it's in my estimation, because I think she really did reinvent the science of economics. I think she replaced Adam Smith as the founder of economic science. And, um, and so, so that's what, you know, that's what she's about. Um, yeah. What was, no, was did I, I think I missed the thread though. What was the, what was the, I, when I, when I read death and life, that, that last chapter just like, it really stood out to me. Um, I mean, the, because it, it was sort of making these points that were even beyond anything about her thesis around cities, but trying to say like, there is this other style of, um, approach understanding that is, um, that we're just ignoring and having read Eleanor Ostrom's stuff beforehand, um, who I think took a similar approach where something that really stood out to me about Ostrom's work was she specifically said that she wasn't trying to come up with a formula or a model for like predicting what the right thing was to do. Um, all she could do was really come up with like a framework and a set of conditions. And I, it was, it was very, uh, I guess, impactful for me to read that because um, I always feel this sort of tug of, in, in my research where um, people want to be able to just like predict something and, uh, and feeling like, you know, if I'm sort of observing something or I'm just talking about the conditions or the framework, like, is that, is that enough? Is that okay? And so I feel like um, the work of Jane Jacobs and Eleanor Ostrom and, and others, um, Stuart Brand, she mentions in, in that letter to you, um, are all these sort of people that are dealing with problems of organized complexity. Um, one of my questions, I guess, because you, you've, you've mentioned a few times that you feel like Jacobs has been I mean, in, in my world, at least, she's been largely appreciated and noticed, but um, certainly I think your point about her crossing over to economics, like her economics work being less appreciated or noticed. Um, like, and, and when I read Eleanor Ostrom's stuff, like she got the Nobel Prize for her work in economics, but we still talk about the tragedy of the commons and we don't talk about her framework. And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering from your perspective, like, why is it that like we see these clear examples of people that are working on organized complexity and making really important points about the world. Um, why do those frameworks not really seem to hold in our minds? I think, you know, there's, we respect uh, psychopaths for some reason. You, you know, if you remember, like at the end of chapter 22 of, of Death and Life, when she's talking about these three kinds of science, you know, the final meditation is somewhat bitter. She talks about this park in upstate New York that has been statistically augmented, but the production of clay dogs is now no longer possible. It's some kind of a natural process on the beach there. And, she, and she, she asks, what kind of a mind, what kind of a person really was comfortable with this simpler form of order when it destroyed of, you know, statistically, you know, expanding the park? when it destroyed organic order. And I think the academy, you know, tends to reward people who do the first two kinds of science. And we, and we think that that is science. And we think, and, and everything that our culture valorizes, you know, power, um, I think maybe the third kind of science is more feminine. And that's one reason why, although it's high, a higher science, it's neglected. Mm. and. Uh, um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of factors like that where, where you're just not quite sure why, and then it's partly like a first mover advantage. Like the the other two kinds of science were discovered first, um, but you know the, the three kinds of science also work. I mean, let me put it another way: the, the, the in, in simplicity science, it's to use the Socratic transcendentals. That's the study of the good of of the good in the sense of what's useful utility. And statistical science is, is the science of the true. But organic science is the science of the beautiful. And that was your original point in this interview. You said she showed that ordinary people opening their eyes, looking around, feeling, uh, sensing. Because what I call um, you know, organic complexity, it's the beauty first approach to science. 
And, and that is the thing that we just cannot accept as a society is the centrality of beauty. And that is the thing which, you know, the modern period and the rejection of liturgy and worship and all that was supposed to free us from was the, the bewitching power of beauty. And, and we were supposed to be truth firsters. And, uh, but there's, like I said, there's something, something pathological about that in the wrong context and, uh, and pushed too far. I hope, I hope I haven't been too violent in my statements here. <laughs> no, I'm like sitting here just like, wow, that's, yeah, it's, that's really beautiful. I think there, you, you made a, a quick reference to this, but the idea of it being um, more feminine is, I think, something I feel really strongly about as well. And that maybe like that is sort of, that we just sort of have a complicated relationship with the feminine um, and maybe we're sort of afraid of it or it makes us uncomfortable. Um, yeah, and in this context for me, feminine meaning sort of like discerning, I guess, and and maybe also beautiful. Um, but yeah, that's sort of like the, the sort of approach that is very observant and sort of sitting back and taking a lot of things in and then analyzing it and then putting an idea out there is, I think, fundamentally different from the approach. The, the more, I guess, deductive, I, I think of it as like deductive versus inductive um, work where in the deductive approach, by contrast, being more like like here's an idea I have and I'm going to go out and like, like prove or disprove it kind of in this sort of um, falsifiable manner is, and maybe when things are a little bit less falsifiable or they're kind of, they're weaving in a lot of different threads in, in complex ways, it just makes people uncomfortable. You know, the, the real vindication of the, of the beauty first approach to science and really of Jacobs, I think is, um, although people wouldn't think of this, it's Warren Buffett because all these, all these truth firsters in, in uh, stock market investing with all their data, you know, I mean, they are statistically, they, they don't do anything, but they, they command so much information. And then these derivatives traders, they're, the, they're your simplicity theorists. I mean, they nearly sank our economy in 2007 and 2008. Whereas Warren Buffett, I mean, that's the beauty first approach to investing. He looks at each business as if it were a living organism. He's asking questions about the health of a company um, in, in, in such a way. And then, and then he even says that he lets you know, each CEO work on their, as their work of art. He doesn't want to get involved in the management of their company. And you know, he's doubling the market rate of return every year since 1960 or whatever it is. And it's, it's, it's the revenge of Jacobs because it is, it is hit, what he's doing is the organic uh, complexity approach to investing. It's a really good example. I would not have thought of that. You know, you know, you know what's interesting is you know who also was a beauty first investor was Keynes, and and Keynes, you know, he's um, he he managed apparently the um, the endowment for Cambridge. I don't think of him much much of him as an economist at all, whereas he's more of a simplicity theorist. But as an investor, he he had a kind of a value investor Warren Buffett approach, and apparently he did very very well for Cambridge. <laughs> But yeah. All right. It, this is making me want to try on an idea and I'll see if I can figure out how to articulate it. But because, um, I mean, when you're mentioning these names, I think of, wow, they, they sort of have been elevated to this like mythological status. And I think part of it is that part of what people are so fascinated by is that it seems almost like the, the strategy seems so simple on its surface and yet so hard to replicate. And um, I wonder whether, I guess, like a, a, the simplicity approach is it's maybe just easier to um, for people to pick up because it is it is more objectively falsifiable. Like if you, uh, it's something that like anybody can kind of pick up and take on and repeat. Um, it's and so it, it lends itself to sort of spreading very virally, I guess, um, because it's yeah everyone is kind of observing it in the same sort of fashion. Whereas like with problems of organized complexity, it's it really is so tied to the lens of like. If, if humans are sort of like vessels for ideas, like it's so tied to the human that is viewing that. And like maybe Warren Buffett can't really, you know, teach someone exactly the way that he sees the world. And maybe that's what makes it really difficult for some of these ideas to, to yeah. spread. I think that kind of just ties back into liturgy itself. It's like, it's easy to tell people things that like, um, like the ideas in your mind, even if you say them, it's like, do people actually understand what you're saying? And like, I think, living that out is 
a better way of understanding what they're getting at. It kind of even reminds me of the, uh, the letters to a young poet that I sent you, um, like not being out, not being able to like live out the answers. And so like the idea is to live out the questions. I think that's hard for people because we just want an answer. We just want to like figure it out now. Um, and like this idea of like having patience and like, um, I think that's hard for people. It's, you know, it is, and in, in, uh, this, you know, the, the young can can access information, but wisdom comes with time because the the whole thing about learning an, or, an organic system is that it's it's going to get to know you as you get to know it, and it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna leave its mark on you. So certain things have to just come with age. You know, there's certain mistakes or or, or regrets that are part of wisdom that just really cannot be skipped. I suppose they skipped with some kind of like, you know, miraculous humility or something, but that's just not most people. It's not me. Yeah. I really like how, um, she talks about how she, you know, loves the city and the people that were doing the work before just seemed like they had their own plan. And I like what you said about it being two way, you know, if we were talking about a relationship, then it is two way. And I think even with knowing God, it's like, uh, it's not just reading some stuff, but, um, understanding the other side. And I like, um, I've heard this saying where it's like, we don't just read the Bible, but the Bible reads us, um, that, you know, it's not just intellectual, but, um, yeah, living it out through liturgy. Kind of touch on this idea of that you mentioned about wisdom being something that you can't just always automatically transfer. Um, and something I've been thinking about a lot recently is the difference between information and knowledge. And I think it, uh, I think it parallels, I hadn't really put this all together, but like, I think it parallels the way Jane Jacobs was talking about, um, cities being a, a, a function of time or the, yeah, like, I guess like I think of information as being sort of like artifacts or things that are easily uh, replicable, falsifiable, um, sort of like a more objective like piece of data. And then I think of knowledge as being um, sort of like the, maybe it is that sort of like active collective wisdom reflected by a, a society that you were, you were just talking about. Um, and sort of like, how do we know when, when we're dealing with one versus the other? Like, how do you know when, I mean, and similarly, even with cities, like, how do you know when you're looking at an artifact versus looking at a piece of knowledge or something that is a living organism? Um, and specifically for, like, for me and, and Henry, when we're talking about open source, like, I think about how, like, code itself is just an artifact. Like, there's no, there's no requirement to maintain code um, if you're just kind of, like, looking at, looking at the code itself. But when we think of code as infrastructure or we think of it as something that someone else is using in their software... Um, suddenly there's like a relationship between the code that I might've published and the code that you're using. Cause it's, uh, and, and, and now we have this sort of, now that I think of, yeah, once you think of code as more than artifact and you think of it as part of a, the living organic infrastructure, then suddenly that time function exists because you're thinking not just about right now, but you're thinking about the future and there's sort of like an implied, um, need for maintenance or, or tending to that. I don't really know if I have a question, but I guess, I guess the question is just sort of like, yeah, how do you know when you're dealing with an artifact versus dealing with like a living organism? Mm. I mean, I, I, I think, I think really one of the benefits of, of death and life is that we should appreciate the Cartesian approach. We should uh, appreciate these reductive approaches. I think we should learn to, in our schooling to get good at each. And so I don't think it's like Jane Jacobs is a holist, I would say. She's holistic, but she's not a holistic who dismisses the reductive. And it's really only in the right in the light of reading that book, Death and Life, that I can speak of, you know, a reductive approach in a positive way. Like sometimes you need just that simplistic I mean, either the electricity is working or it's not. I mean, there are certain situations, right? Um but having said that, I hope that, to answer your question, Nadia, that I hope it makes us feel like, you know, we, we can have our eyes open for when things might be 
you know, acting in unpredictable ways <laughs> where, where the whole yeah. is greater than the sum of its parts or in, in just in the, in the case of software where it would really benefit from, you know, the plans and dreams of many people, you know, coming, coming into play around it. I don't know if that's, a, that's not a great answer, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's, well, and it, keep, it keeps making me come back to that, the function of time that you're talking about of, because there's so, that and this sort of like implied or what I'm hearing and what you're saying is there's once you're sort of in a relationship with something beyond just that objective thing, then there's sort of like a second order thing that happens. Yeah. And it's, and it's really nice the way some people seem to do that, even like for their machines or for, or I mean, an equipment, an equivalent way, like how some people can do it like with a very young child, which to my mind, you know, there's no personality there or there's very little or something. I don't, wouldn't know how to relate to it, but someone who knows the child is able to see the more hmm. and, and bring it out. But like you said, it's, it's second order effects. I think that that's a better answer than anything I would have given. I think that's when you see these second order effects at work, then you're like, uh Oh, what, you know, what's going on here now? There's not going to be a you know a linear connection between my my acting on this thing and what comes out the other end. Right. I think that is what was really nice about uh, Jacob's Jacobs's uh, per perception of this world is like I think of her as sort of like taking all the sort of like objective pieces and then weaving them together into something that like the sum of all the parts is its own organism or it is its own way of understanding it. But like each of those pieces still exists as their own thing. Like a road is just a road, but a road when people are on it is now like becomes a, a problem of organized complexity. Um, and so she's not saying that the artifact is transforming into something living, but more that it is now participating in a system that is a separate thing. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. And now it's, and now, now, it, now it will but like, um, I, I think sometimes they call them desire lines in cities, right? Purposes. Yes. Okay, okay. This thing is essentially a ritual has made that road. And the ritual is everyone is, you know, going that way. That's the way that makes sense. That it's collective wisdom. You know, that's how that's how we're gonna get across campus. So let's put the road there, you know. How do you think about this with religious rituals evolving over time? Because like in my participation in religion, I find sort of a comfort in doing something that I know other people have done for centuries or millennia <laughs> before me. Um, but at the same time, then, yeah, you have these sort of desire lines where, like, what if we want to kind of shape it into something different? And how do you know when it's right to shape it into something else versus, like, it's right to feel that connection to your ancestors or whatever? It just, it's just, it's very hard to, to, to shift. You know, it's hard to invent some, a new ritual that will catch. And um, so the sign the sign that it should catch is, is usually that it has caught and, you know, something it, you know, it's, it's the kind of the collective affirmation around it that, you know, lets you know that, okay, this is, I tried it and uh, other people caught on and here we are. But, but yeah, I think, yeah, that, that feeling of antiquity, by the way, in, in, in Boston at the Emanuel gospel, there's a, something called the Emanuel gospel center, and it is, um, they do urban Christian ministry, but their whole approach is this uh, organized complexity approach. And I'm, I'm trying to find, oh, I just remember the name of their book. It's something like The Cat and the Toaster. And, um, and, and it's, or The Toaster and the Cat, or one of those. And, and it's, you know, the question is, if you're dealing with, some, are you dealing with a toaster or a cat? You know, is it, is it? And, and that has to do with time. Can you take it apart and put it back together? It's a toaster. If you take it apart, are you? Do you belong in jail? That's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thesis. <laughs> it is, and that's and that. You know, so the Emmanuel Gospel Center, like you should see what they like. What they'll do for homelessness, for example, is they've got like my gosh, a whole metabolic pathway of how you know it's not just some linear you're homeless or not. It's this whole, you know, it's like, how close are you to being homeless? How much resilience is, in, is there in your life now? What's separating you from homelessness? And then what are the, what's like the, the, the metabolic pathway by which a person becomes street involved and what keeps them there, what gets them out? 
and it's it's really it's really like you know your biology your high school biology textbook and you look at what they've done and you think ah yes now we're talking someone's thinking jane jacobs would like this <laughs> she really would <laughs> I love this cat toaster test. I'm just thinking about it now. <laughs> and and the, th the thing about the antiquity of, of liturgies or rituals is that they are cats and not toasters. So the idea that you could take them apart and put them back together, um, unless in putting them back together, you do hit, up, hit upon the ancient patterns. I mean, the perennial, not ancient in time, but the timeless forms, um, just not going to happen. You know, it just isn't going to happen. They just, they won't, they won't survive the transition. You'll lose your, your church, your religion, if you do it wrong. It'll just, it'll just go away underneath you. Here's the thing I'm sort of wondering about, going back to sort of like the recursive fractal nature of, of organized systems. There's this, uh, I can't even really remember where it comes from, the, the whole idea of like paper, paperclip maximization, where like you have a factory that's making paperclips and then all, all it knows is it's big paper clips and then it, it's sort of just like it's so focused on the thing <laughs> and you end up yeah you end up just sort of like destroying everything for for the sake of paper clips um and yeah just trying to think a little bit about that like maybe symbiotic relationship between systems of organized complexity but also respecting the um the more objective uh in like how do you know when a system is trying to optimize for something and everyone is kind of talking it through and then, but like it's taking us into like a worse direction in some shape or form. Like how does that system self-correct? Do we trust that can, will the people quote unquote, the people like always end up in doing the right things for themselves within their own bounded system or does sometimes like is out, outside intervention required? Yeah. I mean, outside from where though, I mean, right. you know, <laughs> You know, we are the outside. I think for Jacobs, we are the outside in the sense that, you know, we're, you know, we can think and we can, we can make up, you know, we can innovate. So we've got to be, you know, at it. But yes, you know, systems, you know, get essentially functionally addicted and they just, they just, you know, crush themselves. Well, you know, Jacobs had those, uh, something very hopeful about that. And, and I don't know if this relates to religion or open source or what, but she, she said, she thought that if you looked historically at economies that had declined, the way the liturgy, you know, she didn't use that term, but the way the liturgy failed there, and then, of course, the cities failed as a result, was a, an increasing proportion of the work was being done by slaves, is how she puts it. In other words, people who were not free to develop their own work, to resolve the problems and innovate. And... And what's interesting about that is that as our society gets richer, the definition of slavery functionally, I mean, it, to make this liturgy work, is, is the standard is rising. In other words, I think slavery for us, what's hurting our economy, is that your health care is neither guaranteed by the government nor portable. So no people can't leave their job because they're going to lose their health care. Or it could be regulations or maybe in Silicon Valley, it's at such a high level of development that slavery is, I can't bring my dog to work. <laughs> and, and, and I think there is a sliding scale, you know, in her terms. And so that's what's, that's what's crucial is, is the work being done by slaves or is it being done by free people? And, uh, and, and yeah, so that's her, that's her thing. So it could be just the security of a unionized, a well-paying unionized job in Detroit that is the slavery. It's not a, a real slavery, but I mean, it functionally, you can't leave now. You, you just can't imagine st stepping away from it to start your own, take your own risk or work for a, a you know, a, a start, a startup. Or, and also like the idea that, uh, for me, like a very important, I don't know, organizing principles just are like maximizing um, access to opportunity. And so, yeah, if like, if slaves, quote unquote slaves, if they're, if they can't participate in the system or they're not actually part of this organic, yeah, the, the organic system that is affecting them, but they can't actually participate back in it, then, uh, then something is not working correctly. Right. And think, okay, you know, opportunities for women, immigrants, uh, the, the banking system, and there's just the, the, the fact that somehow public education isn't really working well. I think, um, I think um, just there's a lot of areas where you can say, 
we've got to, we've got to, we're going to have to raise our game. And I don't know what the limit to that is. You know, as J Jane Jacobs said somewhere, you know, from the time we invented fire, we've been riding on the back of a tiger and we can't get off. And we're just going to have to go further. I mean, obviously, right, uh, at some level, the Protestant Reformation, you know, was a, was a political, had a, was, a, was, a, was not a, a political thing, but it was about liturgy in that sense. What, is, what are the lay people doing? And what role are they playing in their own religious life? And the printing press and scripture and all those things, I mean, there was some kind of a sense, no, this, we, can re, we can recapture the, the meaning of liturgy here. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm sure Roman Catholics look at it from a different perspective, but I'm just saying that it is, you know, there's, that's, there's some commonality there. My book, the Eth my book, The Ethics of Beauty, is coming out this summer from uh, St. Nicholas Press in Missouri. And, and the, the final chapter is, uh, is the Jane Jacobs chapter. So you can skip the rest and go straight to that. But um, Fantastic. But the, the, there is something else um, in there, and, and it has to do with, I think, um, I think we need to think about, in terms of the three kinds of science, we need to think about information in terms of its, its quantity, its potency, and its quality. And I think that, um, that the, it's, it's problems in simplicity gives us really potent information, and statistics gives us high quantity. But only organic complexity gives us quality information. And I try in the book to define what I mean by quality, but I think, I think, a, I think the old definition of wisdom is something like, or being wise is uh, um, to have a preference for high quality over high quantity or high potency information about other people, about situations, about systems, you know. And obviously, one thing about the internet is a flood. It's a high quantity information, and then some people are trying to to mine that in potent ways to sell or control you know, merchants and traders, but. Um, but the challenge of being human is, is to learn to, to prefer whenever possible high quality information, right? We should be reading more poetry as we get older. <laughs> so at some point, there should be reading more of the Bible, reading more of, you know, the ancient wisdom texts. You know, there's got to be, um, yeah. More fiction, too. More fiction. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and desiring beauty, what is it that we can say or do that helps us be captured by a spirit of awe and wonder, like Jacob's love for the city? It makes me think of how we seek God in intimacy, to seek a who rather than a what. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to continue the conversation, you can find us on Twitter at leftpad or Nyafia, or on our website, hopeandsource.com.